This is uh, Tarek Week. I am the Director of Technology Alliances here at Snowflake. I manage all of our technology partner ecosystem and excited to talk to you today about how Hitachi Ventara and Snowflake are helping customers become data driven. Kicking it off, most of you have seen some variation of this slide over the last few years, probably a lot of the same magazine covers here. And I think it's silly to argue that data is a critical asset. I think, I think we'll all agree that data has become the most critical asset. And it's the new oil, it's power. Um, the, uh, the, the big thing we can all agree on as well is that the speed at which you can access and process and make sense of the data is really gonna determine which organizations move ahead, and which ones get left behind. We've seen the fastest growing, most successful companies are the ones that are able to really tap into this data, maximize getting insight. And what we wanna do Hitachi and Snowflake is make sure that this goal is attainable for any organization, all of you out there today. So if we think about what the goal is, it's really the goal is a single source of truth, a single platform, remove complexity, move all the data silos. That's really what's slowing down all, all, all projects, all initiatives with data in mind. I think the success rate's still at something like 30%. Let's see why that is. Let's see how Snowflake can address this challenge. First, let's talk about all these changes in technology. We have the rise of the cloud, right? Unlike traditional platforms where we built with scarcity in mind, assuming finite resources, where we had limitations of performance, we're constantly tuning and configuring to make the most of those resources, those, those scarce resources that we had. With the cloud, all of a sudden we have unlimited scale, unlimited capacity. And the key is to take full advantage of that. We've got an explosion of data. I don't have to tell any of you, I think with all of us here, now, um, in these current times, working from home, I, I think I, I sat down and just thought about it the other day. We've got um, a presentation going here. Uh, I have kids at home doing Zoom. Uh, I'm on email. That email has machine learning behind it that helps me become a, a better speller and helps me finish my sentences. I'm using Slack uh, in, in the company, which also has machine learning behind it. My email, uh, some of my email threads go into Salesforce so, so people can um, be able to find out what kind of conversations, engagement we, we've had. Um, to get more insight, it's crazy. How are we able to handle just the, this pure velocity and the variation of data, right? We have all these different types of data coming in. We have our structured data that we've been used to, and now we have this massive amount of semi-structured data coming from modern data sources. And to deal with that, you have this concept of diversification of analytics. And I want to democ democratize, make every user become empowered right? Leverage self-service. And, and not only is that a, uh, is that a hope, it's a requirement now. Uh, everybody's expected to be able to make use of data and be data driven. So if we think about it, what's, what's slowing us down? Let's, it's good to talk about the history of these systems that have been in the market, where they shine, where some of the limitations have been showing up. So first on the left-hand side there, you've got the on-premise data warehouse. It's been around for decades. It's done an adequate job of delivering on performance. You get fast answers that you need to analyze well-defined structured data. And it's easy to use because it's using SQL. I think if, if we look at SQL, it's been around for decades. It's, it's an amazing, brilliant, expressive tool describing the answer you want in an easable, excuse me, an easily readable language. And because of this, these, these EDW systems, on-premise EDW systems grew in adoption where they started to hit the limits when we started to see new data types, semi-structured data right, with, with web and mobile and IoT, they couldn't handle that. They also didn't do a good job of high concurrency, right? We started to get more users accessing data, um, a lot of concurrency. So when we, when we started running workloads at the same time, generally, everyone suffers. So the, the, way, to, to add, the way you traditionally uh, address that is either you buy a bigger box or you have to ration access to the system, which no one loves. Then along came Hadoop and this concept of a data lake. And now with Hadoop, we're able to handle all these different types of data, right? My traditional structured data and my, all my new modern data types. We can put it wherever we want. Uh, so this partially addressed the problem. We, we still had complexity, massive complexity with Hadoop, as everyone here knows. And, and we couldn't use SQL out of the box. You had to learn Python or Scala. Um, you can bolt on an abstraction layer with a SQL engine, but then that just continues to add to complexity. At the end of the day, performance also didn't meet the expectations. Then uh, you keep moving forward here, the first generation cloud data warehouses, right? Now with cloud, we've got this great scale and elasticity that we can take advantage of that we mentioned in the previous slide. But unfortunately, instead of building 
to utilize cloud and all of these advantages. We just took code that was already working on premise and shifted to the cloud. Made it better for sure, right? Easier to spin resources up, but we couldn't take advantage of elasticity and scale. And we still couldn't handle all the, data, all the different data types. Again, mo mostly semi-structured data, all the new modern data e exhaust that comes out of all our modern data, data applications. Uh, then we had the cloud, the, the, the concept of data lake, the newer concept of data lake with cloud storage, right? Started to help ease, again, all the amounts of data and, and it start, starts to handle concurrency because of the ability to scale the cloud storage buckets elastically, um, but performance and, and ease of use are still a big challenge today. So this leads to complexity. This is uh, this picture you see here is, is a pretty good representation of, of the architectures that we encounter as we talk to customers all the time. It's overly complex, it's costly, and um, it's in, this is indicative of what our, all of our customers are dealing with. So you've got a mix of technology stitched together to deliver the raw data from the left-hand side all the way to its intended consumers on the right-hand side. Right? So from the raw data sources, your, your, your transactional databases, your, your CRM and ERP systems, um, your web apps, um, you've got IoTs and sensor data coming in. So from these raw data sources, I, I take it through a data integration layer, uh, then I take it through a data transformation layer and an aggregation layer, finally delivering results to my end users. So I've got multiple tools deployed within each stage. In a lot of cases, you're dealing with files, so governance becomes an issue, security becomes an issue because I've, I've got copies within all these silos. And in the end, you're just you're spending more time on infrastructure than working on the data, which is the entire point. So enter Snowflake. Snowflake was built from the ground up to take advantage of the cloud, not shifting an existing on-premise architecture. So our founders saw that that would, that would end up with limitations. And so with the Snowflake Cloud Data Platform, we're delivering on all these points, right? So you can get the performance that you need, the performance and scale. You can make sure that all your users are accessing all the data all the time. And it's, and, and it's a fully managed service and leverage the SQL as underlying language. So you can leverage all your existing skill sets and all your existing tools. Let's take a deeper look on how we do that. So it, it comes down to architecture, right? This is my favorite talking point, by the way. When you take a deeper look, you realize that Snowflake is truly revolutionary. No one has done this before. And that is, is when our founders were looking at building Snowflake, back about eight years ago, uh, Hadoop was all the rage. So if you weren't leveraging Hadoop, if you weren't building on Hadoop, you were considered crazy. <laughs> Our founders luckily knew that Hadoop just wasn't gonna get, meet all the requirements that you saw on the previous slides. And the complexity was just gonna be too much for most enterprise organizations. So we're, we're software as a service. Think of us as a utility. You pay for only what you use. You sign up, you get access to environment, you connect, you load data, and you start querying. If you look at these different layers, we start out with the dark blue right there at the, at the, at the bottom. That's, that's our storage layer. Single place, centralized, all or as much data as you need. We ingest both structured and semi-structured data natively. We leverage the elasticity, the scale, and the cost, the economics, the blob storage. Uh, the data is logically organized into schemas and tables. The users don't worry about actually managing cloud buckets at all. It's all handled by Snowflake. The second layer, is our multi-cluster compute layer. We separate storage from compute. We uniquely separate storage from compute. So that way you can run multiple isolated workloads across multiple teams without any resource contention, as you'd expect with traditional systems that we mentioned before. It's a cluster of compute nodes. They run queries, they process the data. They can be stopped, started, resized within seconds. It's, it's truly compute on demand. The resizing can also happen during runtime. Snowflake allows you to run as many of these compute clusters as you need to serve a specific workload. We have great workload isolation in Snowflake. That's, that's what this architecture is all about. You can serve any workload independently without any resource contention. And all the compute resources have access to that central storage layer, a single source of truth. And then finally, the third layer, that's the brains, uh, handles all the coordination. We call it the service layer. As the workloads hit Snowflake, these, the scale out services layer determines what requirements are needed to process the data in the most performant and most cost-effective manner. All the transactions, all the metadata management, all the security, the transactional consistency is all managed here inside the services layer without any, any administration from the end user. And then finally, because your data lives everywhere today, Snowflake is cloud agnostic. We support all three major cloud vendors. And the great thing is you can distribute your data 
across cloud regions or even across providers while maintaining the same Snowflake experience. I mean, the net here is that all you have to worry about is loading and querying your data and Snowflake takes care of the rest. So now if we, if we take a look at what we see in the after picture with, a lot, with all of our customers, right? From, from the before picture of that complex architecture, uh, we're, we are truly a cloud data platform. And most people think of Snowflake as a data warehouse. And it's true with leading cloud data warehouse, but the architecture was built to do so much more. For instance, a lot of our customers today are using Snowflake as a data lake. So you can, you can ingest all your data raw in the Snowflake. It doesn't have to be structured. It can be semi-structured as we mentioned before. You can put it into a schema or zone that's considered your raw zone, and you can pick that up and transform it using a, an amazing automation tool like Pentaho and put it in another schema, and then you can analyze and aggregate that. Um, you can put the resultant files into a curated or modeled data zone or schema where your BI users can then connect using any BI tool to support all the popular BI tools. So that's an example of a data lake. We have tons of customers using Snowflake for data engineering, customers doing large transformations that they've tried to do in Spark, but they couldn't do leveraging our multi-cluster architecture with SQL. Again, a proven language has performance and cost economics. Now they're ingesting, merging data, doing data transformations all inside Snowflake. Um, in many cases, they can also export data back out. So, so great support for data engineering. We have this concept data exchange, and it's only available because we built on the cloud and we built in the multi-tenant, we built within a multi-tenant architecture. So now you can provide direct access to any data object in your Snowflake account to another Snowflake account. It could be owned by another customer or another line of business. It's a huge difference versus the traditional way of sharing data is instead of extracting data from a database, zipping it up, encrypting it, sending it over secure FTP, and then unpacking it on the other end and loading into, into the end user's database, um, by the time that happens, the data is, is usually stale. And not to mention that there's cost and complexity with, with copies of data. Uh, these are all live reads against, against secure objects that you can enable and revoke in any moment's notice. So it's changing the game. We have tons of data providers taking advantage of this. Then uh, supporting workload, data application workloads. Because of the nature of leveraging the cloud elasticity, uh, being able to spin up these compute clusters on demand, um, size them, uh, and resize them on demand, it makes a great platform for agile development. So if you think about, I, as a developer, can quickly connect, spin up resources. I can make clones, zero copy clones, which we'll cover in a second here. I can make changes to those clones without any impact to production. Um, once I'm done, I can throw those compute resources away. I can, if I need to come, you know, stop and come back, I can pause and resume. Uh, and I'm only paying for the, the, the compute that's running. So amazing platform for building data applications. And we've got a, a ton of customers that actually build their application on Snowflake. It's powered by Snowflake. And then finally, data science. It's a hot area for Snowflake right now. A lot of feature engineering is done inside of Snowflake. And we've got some support across a multitude of amazing um, machine learning partners that uh, are able to then make it seamless uh, workflow to, to build and iterate across the machine learning models. What's important here is if you think about this automation on the streaming end, on the data warehouse, the data lake, the data engineering end, this is where we've got amazing synergy with Pentaho. And we'll talk about that um, when Naveen gets up. So finally, let's dig a little more in the architecture. I think, I think what really makes it shine is just giving you an example of it in action here, right? So, um, and then of course, we, have, we, we love to use our logo in the architecture here. <laughs> so if you think about the storage layer being in the middle, and the compute layers, or what you'll see as, as compute layers uh, and the workloads being out of the outer edges, we've got this concept again of multi-cluster compute architecture. So let's assume that we have a data load operation happening for ingesting some core data into the platform. It could be data that, that you're loading daily um, or, or weekly or monthly or even quarterly, but it's data, that it's predictable. It's manageable in size, it's a predictable window that it loads in. So given this, we allocate a, a what's called an extra small. We, we size our, our compute clusters in, in a t-shirt model, right? Extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. And the difference is the amount of nodes in the cluster. And as you see, you can resize uh, on the fly uh, as the demand changes. Um, you can add clusters as more users are added to the system. And I'll, again, I'll demonstrate them in a second here. So again, go back, we have a data load operation happening. Then at the same time, we have some data transformation processes that need to run maybe against that new data coming in. 
maybe a, a just part of a regular process, regular routine to support another business function. They're a little more compute intensive, so we give this workload an S cluster. And, and note here that you see both arrows, we're doing both reading and writing to Snowflake without interrupting any other workload that's running at the same time. And then uh, let's say we have a finance app, a little heavier load, you know, doing massive reading, so we, we give that a large. And then um, we have a data science workload over here. Uh, data scientists are iterating on their models, so let's say that's also a large. And um, all, these, all these workloads can be scaled independently of each other. So they're all running against that single copy of data without any resource contention, without any performance degradation or concurrency limitations, uh, something only Snowflake can deliver. Again, it's, it's, it is an amazing, unique architecture. So let's look at how we scale as these workloads adapt and change um, over time. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's all, let's, let's also assume a marketing app over here where I've got BI users accessing the system. So Snowflake can be scaled on two dimensions. The first one is to be able to scale up and down, basically changing the size of that compute cluster. It can be done, again, instantly during runtime. Uh, the size of that cluster will directly, will, will directly address the query performance. So let's say that uh, the data science team determined that their model needs additional compute so in order to complete in time. So they can scale up to an extra large, let's say for 30 minutes. And once it's done, they can scale it back down to large. Uh, they can scale it down even further. They can even shut it down if it's not needed anymore, completely flexible. Then on the top, let's talk about the second dimension that we scale in, which we call, again, multi-cluster scale out for concurrency. So in this scenario, we just start to see an increase in requests hitting at the same time at the same compute cluster. So instead of having to queue the request, which you normally would have to do, we just automatically scale out by adding more compute clusters to the workload. It's all done automatically. And uh, if the workload increases, we scale out horizontally. If it decreases, we scale back. We can get rid of the compute clusters no longer needed. So the key takeaway, Snowflake architecture is ensuring workload isolation. Every cluster is scaled independently. Uh, and this workload isolation is the key to support the varying workloads uh, and, the, and, and a massive amount of concurrent users. So uh, real quick, just sharing data. Again, I don't want to uh, spend too much time here uh, talking about the data sharing. I'll, we can give, give you more information um, as needed here. So sharing data. Again, we're facilitating how teams exchange data both inside and outside the organization. Right, this concept of secure data sharing, it's gonna, it eliminates the overhead inherent in the traditional solutions, like I talked about before, the pain of extracting and FTPing data back and forth, um, and the security uh, implications around that, as well as just the, the you know, how, how uh, stale that data becomes over time. So the concept of public-private data exchanges, allowing these teams to create data products that are easily discoverable within, within the organization and also to external stakeholders. And then back to, um, the concept of data cloning. So we can create these zero, what we call zero copy clones of a table, a schema, a complete database. It's a pure metadata operation. So you're not actually copying data itself. So there's no additional storage needed. And you can create as many of these clones as you need. Let's say some developers running tests, they want to develop new features. You can leverage clones as a, cop a pure copy of production. They can be used for backups. They can be used for data snapshots for machine learning uh, model iteration. So going back to the cloud data platform, what, what are customers asking for to get this goal of a single source of truth, right? So again, they want a single platform, one copy of data with performance, with scale. They wanted to be, make sure that that's secure, right? We were, we, we were built with security from the ground up, right? Full encryption, full role-based access controls, um, compliance across you know, HIPAA and, 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 and um, SOC 3 and, and all the other certifications out there that you can read about. And then we don't want to spend time maintaining infrastructure. So the, whole, the platform is delivered as a service with near zero maintenance. We've got over 3,400 customers across a multitude of industries, uh, across a multitude of sizes. And uh, this is just a, a great um, you know, evidence of, of the, the great success, as well as you know, this is what customers are, are trying to get to. This is the goal they're trying to achieve, right? Single source of truth, eliminate complexity, eliminate all my data silos. And let me finally focus on making sense of data to, to move ahead. So with that, thank you very much. I will hand off to Naveen, and um, I'll be on the chat window to answer any questions. Thank you, Tarek. So yeah, at uh, Hitachi, we are pretty excited to work with the Snowflake, and you saw all the cool features and capabilities of the toolset. 
we just saw the modern data architecture that uh, Tarek presented. And it's amazing how all these different components work so well with the, what Lumada Data Services has to offer. So in our portfolio on the left side, on the data source and the ETL and streaming side, we have the whole Pentaho data integration uh, suite of products. So that works well with the, the data ingestion, the transformation and all those capabilities. And once you move over to the middle side where we have all the data engineering and data lake, those kind of components in place, that's where the uh, Lumada portfolio has a lot of components which work well in that realm also. On the consumption side, uh, again, we have the Pentaho business analytics suite of products where we give uh, some visualization and reporting capabilities on top of all that data. So here to keep things going, uh, we, we work with a lot of customers. Everybody who looks at Snowflake is pretty excited because the kind of challenges uh, people are facing with the, all the different kinds of data they have to work with. So we've seen a lot of rapid growth of data. And there was a time in not so distant past where uh, we would uh, work with the data lake, with Hadoop ecosystems, and uh, push data and spin up a, a cluster of uh, Hadoop nodes to work with all that data. So in this case, we were working with the retail data analytics firm. And what they had was uh, an issue where they were looking to sign up uh, a lot more customers. So they were expecting exponential data growth. And with that also came the ask to provision more number of users to be able to get to all that data. Everybody knows that when you talk to data scientists and when they have their models running on all the data, they don't want to work with the, a month worth of data. They would rather have at least a year, if not more. So that was another big ask from the customer. In this case, uh, from the technology, technical use case perspective, what we were looking at is all these disparate uh, data sources, which were geographically dispersed all over the uh, world and we had to gather all this data and uh, they already had a process in place where they would ingest the data pro put it in their uh, on-premise data warehouse and process all that data with the petaho data integration and once all the data is processed there were some reports on-demand reports which were generated and also the users would go in and run some analyzer queries to look at data on an ad hoc basis. So now, they, like I said, they were expecting to roll out this solution to like 150 new stores. So they were expecting the data to go up 100x and the on-prem data warehouse that they had, that was not capable or sized could not be even scaled out or scaled up to be able to handle that kind of data volume. So that's when uh, we were engaged and we went in with the proposal to look at the Snowflake and evaluate if that technology would work for them. So these are the few key points which uh, one is that it's it's in the cloud right so there's a lot of uh, maintenance which is eliminated they don't have to worry about uh, the nightly patches and bringing the infrastructure down and you know, the availability factor and snowflake has sql compatibility so you already have a team of engineers data scientists who are comfortable working with sql so there is no learning curve to adopt to this new technology. And uh, the storage, all the storage is managed by Snowflake. So it works, like Tarek mentioned, it works off of uh, your object stores in the cloud. So whether it's uh, your Amazon S3 buckets or uh, Azure or GCP storage. And 
it's JDBC compatible. So, like I said, they had the Pentaho data integration working with the, all those ETL jobs, and Pentaho is uh, supports JDBC. So that was a pretty easy transition and uh, good sale for the customer. And again, like Tarek mentioned, the storage and compute is decoupled. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, adding new nodes to the cluster if you have a bigger uh, data you need to ingest, or if you want to provision a lot more users, then you don't have to uh, you don't have to worry about adding those capabilities. So at the high level, this is a solution design that we put together. So on the left, uh, so. These are the different uh, sources that you would work with. And using PDI, you would ingest all this data. And instead of writing to that on-prem data warehouse, you would write to flat files, which were zipped up and uh, mostly flat text files. And this, using PDI, these data files would be pushed to the Snowflake internal staging area. So stages are where the data is stored temporarily until it's pushed to the actual tables in Snowflake. So after the data is pushed to that staging area, then PDI takes it from there and does a bulk load into the, uh, the target tables, which is in the database, Snowflake database. So let me give you a quick demo of what we did. So what we did was, this is the architecture that we put together. So in this case, uh, I took some sample data, which is publicly available, which is the Chicago crime data, and put it into a Postgres database, which is running locally. So, and the table input step reads that data from the underlying table. And we do some transformations to that data. And here in the end, instead of writing to a database using a table output step, we write it to uh, flat files with the text file output. So here, if you see, if uh, this is all writing to this file name, which is all variable driven, and the content tab. So this is where you'll see some things which typically uh, uh, customers don't use on a day-to-day -day basis. So one is that we apply a gzip compression to the output file. And also one of the best practices is to bulk load a lot of smaller files instead of one huge file. So in this case, I'm using this option to split the file at every 1 million rows. So that way we, we get to see a lot of smaller files and that makes the bulk load a lot more scalable and faster on the Snowflake side. So this is the transformation which generates those uh, text file output files. And on the Snowflake side, once you go and log into the Snowflake portal, you will see this ribbon across the top. So if you go under databases, see all the uh, Snowflake databases. So I've created one. PDI underscore Snowflake database. And then you have all these different objects which are present in the database. So right now you can see there's no table available. And uh, I created a schema, the Chicago PD. So by default, it comes with these two out of the box schemas when you create a database. So I added this new schema, which will have the table inside it. and uh, Stage. So stage, like I mentioned, stage is that temporary location where uh, the data files are uploaded. So in this case, uh, we are using a Snowflake managed stage. So if you were to create a new stage, you would see these different options. So one is Snowflake managed, which, which we are using in this case. Or you could have external staging pointing to an Amazon S3 bucket or Microsoft Azure or GCP. So this is what it is in, in this case, Snowflake managed staging area. And uh, then we were talking about the 
decoupling of the storage and compute. So stages are, think of stages as your storage layer and warehouse is your cluster of the compute resources in Snowflake. So warehouses is what you would use to do your uh, uh, data manipulation operations. So if you wanted to do a select or if you wanted to do a load or uh, anything to do with data, you would use warehouses. And you can see there are multiple warehouses which are uh, created at the moment. So these are all independent of each other and they, every warehouse uses, uses its own uh, CPU memory and storage resources. So right now, if we go back to Spoon, so uh, let me show you. So if, if we run this query, you see there is no table. So if I do a select count star from the table, it does not uh, return me anything. In fact, it gives me an error saying the object does not exist. So going back to the Snowflake job, once you've created those uh, output files, then the next step is to push it to the Snowflake stage and do a bulk load into the tables. So now from within Pentaho, we have all these VFS connections. So you would create, you would have a VFS connection which goes to your Snowflake staging area. So on the left hand side in the view pane, you could create a new VFS connection and the connection type would be Snowflake staging in this case. And I've already done that. So that's called Snowflake VFS in this case. Now from within the Pentaho job, we have a lot of components which are which work uh, uh, seamlessly with Snowflake. So the warehouse can be created from a job. So you would specify a warehouse name, give it a comment and warehouse size. So this is what Tarek mentioned about uh, the different sizing options for a warehouse. So in this case, I'm starting it off as a medium size warehouse and it can go from extra small to 4XL, kind of like t-shirt sizes. And then these other options, and then there is the uh, scale out options in this cluster count, minimum cluster count and maximum cluster count. This is where you could spin up multiple clusters if the workload needed. If, if Snowflake saw a lot of queries being queued up, so, so it could automatically spin up uh, new instances of the process nodes in this cluster. So that's how you could create a virtual warehouse. Then there is a job entry to start the Snowflake warehouse. You would tell it to start this virtual warehouse, which you just created, and then load the data into the uh, Snowflake database. And once everything is done, you can also stop the virtual warehouse from the Pentaho job itself. So in this case, it puts it in a suspended state. So let me quickly run this job. So it, it goes ahead and uh, goes into Snowflake and creates those objects. So you saw a Snowflake data warehouse database connection, which uh, again is a JDBC connection to the Snowflake warehouse. And it's using the JDBC driver, which Snowflake provides. And uh, you can see you give it a host name, the warehouse name, database name, and it goes ahead and connects to that instance. So if you've been using Pentaho, this is the same interface as you would use for any other RDBMS. So it's the same set of options. And then on the Snowflake load side, uh, we have these three options. So you would uh, run a SQL job entry to create the table. So this creates the table in Snowflake and 
this is how you would stage the files, take it from your local file system, use a put command in the SQL job entry. And once the files have been uploaded, there is a, a Snowflake bulk load job entry, which would take the files from that staging area. And since we had gzipped it, we, you can specify all those options. So it can take all these different uh, compression options. And on the output side, you tell it to write to this table. So these are the options you can specify. And if you want to truncate and reload, you would check this box. And then if there are some, because Snowflake supports a lot of extra switches and flags and parameters. So anything that you need to pass in can be passed on from this advanced options tab. So let's see. So it looks like the job is done, except I got this error. Okay, that's how it happens when you do a demo. It was okay, tables. I see the table. I don't know why it's showing that error, but the table is there. We can see the table is created. And uh, it loaded 101.4 million rows. So that was pretty fast. So in case uh, we want to go again and see if we run this query in the worksheet. OK, I see that it did load 101 million rows. And going to the history tab, you will see. So the history tab on the Snowflake side captures all the commands that come in. So in this case, you can see that uh, it started this, so it created the warehouse, it uh, copied the data into the warehouse, and this is where it took like 47 seconds to load 101 million rows. So that was pretty fantastic from the client, and they absolutely loved this. So anyway, so these, these are the, th so here, it, Okay, it came up, came up. So you can see all, it loaded all these different files and gives you some stats on how many rows were passed, how many rows were loaded, and if it's ran into any errors. And in total, it loaded 101 million rows in 47.2 seconds, which is pretty amazing. So these are some of the components that we have pre-built uh, to work with Snowflake. And other than that, we have couple more. So now in this case, uh, we created a warehouse and started a warehouse and start the warehouse. There are some other job entries. So you can also, if you already have a warehouse which has been created, you can use a job entry to modify. So modify, you could change it on the fly to a different uh, size. So go from a medium to a Excel or a 4XL, depending on the workload. And uh, there's also a job entry to delete a warehouse. So let's say it's a temporary workload that you run and once everything's done, you want to delete it. Then this job option, job entry would come in pretty handy in that case. So we would really love you guys to go, go ahead and sign up for a trial account on Snowflake. Snowflake gives you a 30-day full-featured trial. And uh, on the Pentaho side, download Pentaho 9.0. You can, uh, we'll send you this, uh, the job, this, this pattern, which I just demoed. And you can run this on the cluster and see things for yourself, play around. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And uh, this is a pretty exciting set of technologies. And we works quite well with what Snowflake has to offer. So I would encourage you guys to go sign up for a trial account, download the Pentaho data integration tool and see it for yourself. Okay, thank you so much.